before we continue, obviously, you want to define what a plant-based diet is, because there may be people in the audience who may not know exactly what that means. And it's a diet that is made consistently of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, herbs, and spices. And it excludes all animal products, including red meat, poultry, fish, eggs, and dairy products. So let's get started about one of the main points about a plant-based diet and how it affects the planet, or what we call the plant-based quad factor, which is human health, planetary health, animal welfare, and reduction of pandemic risk. But let's start with planetary health, Maggie. Let's talk about the effects that plant-based diet has on the planet, and what is it from your perspective? Well, I'll go back to that date, 1981. And I think, I mean, you know, I think we think we're discovering all this, but people have been telling us this for years that we were headed for exactly where we are now. I think many of you may know, and Isaias is great with statistics, <clears throat> that the inefficiency of an animal agriculture diet is really the problem, along with the emissions of greenhouse gases from the methane created from um, animals as well. So... Basically, many of you probably realize, if you take all the grains and vegetables and feed them to animals, how much food will you get out of there? It's considerably less using tremendous amounts of water and soil. I bet you have those stats. Yeah, you know, I would say that to kind of start off is like, how much are we producing of natural resources being used for products? So if we look at, you know, a pound of a beef meat, right, it takes like 20 to 30 gallons of water just to produce one. Um, and the environmental impact to produce like plant-based items like legumes, beans, other materials, um, they use less amount of water. And so when we look at the data that has shown in industrial agriculture, uh, specifically like meat factory farms, you'll see that the amount of water they've been using is depleting natural reservoirs and it's also contaminating local water sites. So right now, if you go to certain rural communities where they're lo located nearby factory farms, you'll see that there's a higher level rate of air pollution. I believe that it's you're four times more likely to develop heart disease um, and other respiratory illnesses. And then when it comes to water pollution, um, obviously if children are drinking that at a young age, it's going to cause um, brain development issues issues because of the nitrate and elements that are um, also harmful on that end. But shifting just to a plant-based diet has shown in our global food supply chain that it can reduce it to 40 to 50 percent of our current usage. And that's actually really needed because what we're seeing right now is industrial agriculture is continuously growing year over year where they're continuously putting more subsidies into more meat, more dairy. And what that's going to cause in the future is going to cause an ecological collapse where local farmers have been displaced from their own lands. They've been displaced of their own knowledge. And for us to feed this titan, right, what you would call it, um, we're essentially just um, pushing for our resources to be depleted and also for our future generations to have less items and less um, access to food. So when it comes to some of the other effects of animal agriculture, deforestation is a huge problem. What a lot of people don't realize is when a piece of meat arrives on your plate, that animal may consume vast quantities of water. And as you can see this powerful statistic on the screen behind us. But there's also the land that is cleared to plant soybeans so that people can eat those animals. The animal agriculture industry clears vast swathes of forests, uh, and it is becoming an ever-increasingly large problem. Maggie, when it comes to sort of like the, the diet that people eat on a, on a daily basis, perhaps the sad diet, the standard American diet, what do you think it will take to help people understand the impact of the individual dishes? Because I think when people buy their food from the supermarket and they, they purchase those products, they don't see the supply chain that exists behind that individual steak. But what do you think we need to see more of to help people see the big picture? I think the first thing we need to do is break the chain of disinformation, which uh, we were speaking about earlier. There is a lot at work in promoting misinformation because of the market value to the corporations who stand to benefit from that. So the first thing we have to do is get around that. So a lot of us have to get around our own indoctrination into what is a healthy meal, first of all. Many of us have been taught from early age, you have to eat meat, you have to eat dairy. And so we have that deep indoctrination and it's informed our taste buds as well as all of our habits. So the first thing is we have to break that so that we have to know, oh, okay, this, this plant-based diet is actually healthy for you. 
it's actually tasty. That's another challenge, right? Because we, people want to do the least challenging thing. We just do by nature. Our days are hard. We want to make our day less stressful, right? So how can we make it less stressful? We eat something we like, right? So the, really important that we have this advent of plant-based products and plant-based menu items, et cetera, that people can eat so that they can, first of all, get turned on to the fact that this food that is better for the planet is also healthy for a human. I'd love it if you talk about the disinformation right there. Mm, absolutely. So there's two types of information in this sense. There's misinformation, there's disinformation. And misinformation is knowledge or content that you may share on social media that you assume to be true, but it may be untrue. But you uh, share it because maybe your mum shared it or your dad shared it or one of your friends shared it because you trust that connection on social networks. But behind that misinformation is often a lot of disinformation, which is information that is created by organisations specifically to see doubt into the public. They want people to focus on maintaining the status quo, whether it's their diet, whether it's politics, whatever. There is a lot of information that's put out in this disinformation way, and it's designed to spread. I don't know if everyone's seen the documentary, The Social Dilemma. It really talks a lot about this study on Netflix, which, um, on, on Twitter, sorry, which talked about how misinformation actually spreads six times, seven times faster than true information. So we have to be very careful about what we share on social media when it comes to facts and information because what it can do is it can perpetuate um, mistruths that can really affect people's lives. And of course, the climate crisis is, is a big part of that. So be very conscious about what you're sharing. And I'd love to hear what you think, Isaiah, it's about misinformation, about the knowledge we have on social media and how we can kind of really decide whether something is worth sharing or not. Yeah, you know, I'd say that reimagining interrogation into education as an opportunity, what I think right now, since we've become very politicized over the last few years, is that it's almost an either or situation, right? Either you're going to be talking about this, or if you don't, you're a bad person. And so I think that we have to understand, like with all of us here, like all of our friends that want to learn more about plant-based eating, or like what is the best information out there? How do I educate people who are younger than me is about asking where is the resources coming from? Where exactly um, is producing this information? Who funded the research? Because more often than not, you'll realize that um, the research that is being funded right now by certain uh, corporations and large scale industries is directly going into squashing these plant-based companies or to these experts that have been in this field. And the other thing is that how language is such a powerful tool that is also a dangerous tool, meaning that there are people that often really get into this pipeline, into the outright in perpetuating many harmful ideologies that directly are displacing and also harming a lot of black indigenous people of color globally. So if we're not really asking more questions and critical thoughts about, you know, where's our food coming from and who is sponsoring these types of policies, why aren't we able to fight against these industries through the legal lens, um, then we may be, able, we're missing information that's going to lead to a lot of people having fragments frameworks that's going to lead them to have more questions and more anger towards the subject that leads to violence. So one of the playbooks out there that the tobacco industry used for many, many years uh, was a leaked memorandum and the title of that memorandum was Doubt is our product. And the, the focus of the tobacco industry was to really create enough doubt in the public and the people's minds over whether smoking was dangerous or not, whether it would kill you or not, cause disease. It took 9,000 studies for the powers that be, essentially, in the United States to finally put through uh, legislation that showed how smoking caused cancers and killed people. The animal agriculture industry is operating around the same playbook. There is a lot of misinformation being put out on a daily basis, and it really distorts the truth and the true picture about what's happening out there in the, uh, in, in the world today. 